All right, good evening, everyone. Good to see everybody again. Thank you for coming out to the April Lanchester Real Estate Investment Meeting. My name is Jake Byler. I am your host for the meeting. And once again, I'm excited about what we got coming. I think I say that pretty much every time. And that's because it's pretty much true every time. Uh, always uh, fun to meet, fun to get people together and learn on a variety of different topics, mostly relating to real estate investing, but not always, as you'll see tonight. So a um, couple quick announcements. If you are not on our email list and you would like to be, there is a t uh, paper on the table in the back with instructions of how you can get on our email list. This group was simply created for a place for real estate investors, business owners, entrepreneurs, people that just want to learn uh, to get together, learn from each other, and it has been a, uh, a great source of inspiration and learning in my life, and it is wonderful to do that with a group of people like all of you. Um, as most of you know, these meetings are primarily paid for by sponsors. Our sponsors for this year are Joe Leofsky from Compass Property Management, Dave Wolf, Principal Mortgage Group, Chet Lapp, Providence Abstracting Company, it's a title company, Ben Yoesh, local real estate agent and a great friend of mine. We'll get to hear from him in a little bit. And uh, Molly Lanka Federal Credit Union and Jeff Moeller as a private lender. I don't think Jeff is in the room tonight unless he snuck in the back there, but Jeff is oftentimes here. He's one of our board members. So we generally like to um, have uh, Ben Yoash or one of his team members provide a little bit of a market update or market news or something relating to real estate. So Benuel's going to share a little bit tonight. Benuel, you can come on up. Um, Benuel's going to share, I think, mostly on the news side of the latest in real estate. Thank you, Jake. It's always good to be here. So we have Joe Leofsky to thank for this. Uh, he got in touch yesterday and su suggested a couple topics. And I was like, yeah, you know, haven't given it a lot of thought yet, but that sounds more interesting than anything that I was about to share. So we're coming into a booming spring market. That's fun, but that's about all the update you're going to hear on that tonight. So how many of you have heard about the recent NAR lawsuit uh, regarding real estate commissions? I'd love to see a show of hands in there. I'll be disappointed if it's not almost everyone in the room. Oh, it's news to some people. Okay, well, that's great. So the backstory is, uh, I'm not sure, this might have started six months ago, maybe a year ago. Uh, a really slick real estate attorney got a group of home sellers together and basically brought the argument to a court that, look, NAR has been fixing commissions, the National Association of Realtors, and therefore realtors are making too much money and we should sue NAR. And so they did. And ultimately, that sort of spawned a whole group of lawsuits by multiple realtors that said, oh, okay, there's some money to be made here. You know, the, the case is gaining some merit. And so eventually, NAR just said, hey, you know, this is getting out of hand. We're going to settle. And a big part of the reason they did that was because it essentially set the case law for future lawsuits coming forward so they weren't going to have to spend the next decade fighting, you know, just playing whack-a-mole with lawsuits coming up. Uh, so it's kind of ironic. You know, they, in a sense, you know, won the settlement. And it's what's ironic to me about it is that it's coming from attorneys, a group of people that have an equally set standard, and the group of attorneys that brought this lawsuit, I'm assuming, will walk with over $100 million in compensation from it. So that's kind of interesting. But regardless of what we think of the irony of that, uh, a couple important things came out of it. Um, one was that starting sometime this summer, realtors will no longer be able to offer buyer's agent, or they will no longer be able to advertise buyer's agent compensation on the MLS. So they can still offer it. It doesn't change the fundamental of it. It just changes how it is offered. So now, if I bring a buyer, I'll have to reach out to that agent and ask, hey, you know, what's, what's being offered here? What do I have to have my buyer pay for as a difference? Or however that ends up panning out. But that's, so that's one thing that's changing. The other thing is just public perception. I'm kind of amazed that not more of you raise your hands here because I... Yeah, this has been all over the news. So actually, kind of congratulations if you didn't see it, because that means you're keeping your nose where it belongs for the most part. <laughs> but, <laughs> but 
But yeah, so the second one is way more important than the first, just the public perception. I st sort of started seeing this pop up in conversations like earlier this year, January, February, well, late last year even, it was hitting the news cycle some. So people start asking the questions, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Because, uh, you know, what isn't changing, what's always been the case is that look, commissions have been negotiable. Just like when you go talk to your attorney or your dentist or whoever it may be, you know, their compensation has always been negotiable and, you know, that, that hasn't changed. Um, but that conversation, I think, will lead to, I think the biggest change we're going to see is I think there will be a reduction in commissions offered to buyer's agents. And in some cases, none will be offered. So that probably does mean, you know, if you as buyers have been, you know, just going out with your realtor and expecting they'll get paid when the deal closes and you won't come out of pocket, some of that may be changing. Um, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of, you know, interesting things that could come out of it. Um, so yeah, that's been fun to observe. Um, how that actually plays out in each of your day-to-day -day is, you know, it remains to be seen. But you'll probably end up, you know, over time, paying less as sellers, but coming out of pocket some as buyers. And so one of the ways that this will probably pay play out is we've long had, you know, it's been common to see seller assist for as long as I've been in business and well beyond. Uh, so I think we'll probably see the cap on what we're allowed to ask for for seller assist on the buy side. That will probably increase. And I'm guessing we'll see options for buyers to finance the commission that they're paying their agent into the deal as well. Uh, so there will be some help there. You know, one of the things that will not be great, that this will not be great for is like first time buyers that can't afford to come out of pocket to pay their, uh, their agent. Now they're, you know, stuck into some less than desirable situations potentially where they're, you know, they're forced to work with the seller's agent because they can't pay their own. Uh, but I think there will be ways that the market, you know, taps into that. So yeah, that's my perspective on it. Um, I don't know if Jake's going to chip in on that at all, but feel free to now if you're going to, Jake. For people that have not heard anything about this before, it might be a little confusing, but are there any questions? Anyone, anyone have any questions for Benio on that? Everybody's just shocked, Benio. Either that or I made it so <laughs> clear that <laughs> nobody needs to ask more. So it's definitely <laughs> something that has, um, there's a lot of people, I've heard some people say it's going to completely change the landscape of how realtors work, and some people are saying, I don't even see that a whole lot's going to change. And my guess is it's going to be somewhere in between there, but it, it remains to be seen. Yeah, the, the, most, uh, the biggest adjustment will probably be how buyers' agents are, are discussing this with their buyers. Like up until today, the conversation has pretty much been, oh, you want to go buy a house? Great, let's go look at a bunch. And, you know, once you find the one that's the, p the pick for you, it's pretty much assumed that your agent's commission is baked into the deal up front. Like, they're, they're getting paid, you know, probably 2.5%, 3% of whatever you're buying. You're not coming out of pocket for that. Now the conversation up front needs to be, look, you know, we may get into a situation where that compensation is offered, or we may not. If we end up in one where it's not, then you need to be prepared to come out of pocket for that amount. And I think, you know, like all things, there will be... I would, I would think we'll see more like agents coming out with packages of, hey, here's what I can offer you, here's what it's going to cost you, including, you know, there will be hourly rates probably for working with your agents like you might see with attorneys and so on. So there will be some interesting shifts there as, as we all, you know, sort of try to figure out that trend. But for the most part, I would expect that in those scenarios, I mean, it's already been happening where you see a reduced commission and, you know, I'll just, we'll have the conversation with the buyer and we'll say, hey, you know, we can offer additional seller assist to cover that difference. There's all kinds of options that have existed. So. Yeah, and what you're saying is mostly from the buyer's agent perspective. In a sense, not a whole lot is going to change on the seller's agent side. But so let's just let's just think about a real life scenario for a little bit. Let's say after this whole thing becomes official after July, whatever it is. Let's say me as a seller comes to you and says, "Hey, I want to." list my mansion on the river, which I don't have one. Uh, it's, it's a $2 million property. You can see the river from it, though. <laughs> it's kind of cool. <laughs> and let's say I am a buyer, I'm a seller that says there's no way I should be paying 6% commission. I'll pay you 2% to list it, but I don't want to pay a buyer's agent anything. Mm -hmm. 
what would your response be to that? Well, and how, what should a seller be thinking about because you could totally do that. In fact, many agents, maybe not the more experienced professionals, but many agents would take a $2 million listing for probably 1%. Sure. So. Yeah. yeah, and that's, you know, that option has always been on the table. Right. It's just been much less common. have not been aware of it for the most part. Yeah. It's I would just not been normal. Right. Anyone that's spent time in the business, I would say, probably has some sense that it exists. They just, it's like asking your dentist for a 50% discount. Like, who does <laughs> that? There's some element of that to it. But, yes, so my response to you now would be the same as it has been. You know, unless the whole industry shifts to where nobody's offering buyer's agents compensation, because then it's a different conversation. Then right. it's like, Nobody's expecting it. There's no reason to offer it when that's the case. Right. But now it would be, okay, if you're offering zero, you're essentially either going to, like, you're probably going to end up paying the buyers in some form or fashion. Either you'll be, you know, either they're going to be asking for seller assist to cover for their agent or their agent is going to, or the buyers are going to come directly to me and then I'm also representing them, which sure. creates a little bit of a situation that I don't love to be in, that sure. dual agency. Right. Uh, so then you're probably paying me a small portion to cover for them too. So one way or the other, you're probably paying for it in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. So just offering it up front so far has just led to a more seamless um, you know, transaction as a whole. Sure. So we'll see. Like we may end up in a world where that's common and that's totally acceptable. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's no problem. That's the new standard. Um, but we're far from there now. We'll just right. see if it goes that direction, and if right. so, how soon. And, and on that example, you might be wondering, well, how would a buyer's agent even know that no commission is being offered? And the answer to that is probably by sending the buyer's agent a text message, mm -hmm. the seller's, yeah. seller's agent. Yeah. Uh, you'll probably get a lot of those starting sometime this summer. Right, yeah, So right on. it's interesting, like, I don't know. I think the landscape will likely shift a bit, but uh, remains to be seen, so. For most of you, I guess that's your first introduction into the whole lawsuit thing, so. But now you know, so. Okay, well thank you for sharing that, Benio. Let me grab my notes and uh, we will continue here. Any final thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, we're good. Uh, yeah, you can just put the mic over on the table, it's fine. All right, so for those of you that came to the meeting specifically for real estate, that's about what you're going to get tonight. There might be some real estate related topics woven into the rest of the meeting, but probably not very much, not as much as we do on a normal evening. Um, it's a little bit hard for me to even know exactly how to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Um, most of you have been coming to the meetings. I announced it last month, uh, but if you haven't read the emails or, or anything, uh, our guest speaker for tonight is Judge Jeffrey Conrad from the Lancaster County Court of Common Pleas. And you might wonder, what in the world does that have to do with real estate? And the answer is probably nothing, probably very little. The reason that I personally thought it would be great to have Jeff here is because I have met him a number of times at a breakfast meeting that I attend occasionally, and I have heard him tell stories of things that have happened in the courtroom and how he has approached them from a Christian perspective. Um, a lot of us, let me start by saying this. So I don't know how about most of you, but I grew up thinking, even as a Christian, that if you were you know, a pastor or a preacher or a missionary, you were still you know, a, better, a better Christian than someone that just worked every day, right? You're, you're definitely more, more spiritual, more religious, more special, right? Um, I also grew up thinking, for whatever reason, that what we, did on, what we did on Sundays and going to church was completely removed from what we did on a day-to-day -day basis and interacting with people. And today, my thinking on that has completely changed. And I'm not necessarily telling you that to tell you how you should think, but I'm telling you that to just give you an understanding of why I think it's great to bring someone in that's going to be speaking on an entirely different topic. The work that uh, Judge Jeff gets to do on a daily basis from a Christian perspective, I think you will find quite interesting. Um, it's a very different environment that most of us uh, could even imagine being in. Uh, and it's an environment where... I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I'm guessing it's an environment 
where you know applying biblical principles and living by them is not the norm in a setting like that. So really excited to hear some of what Jeff is going to be talking about. Uh, I don't even know what he's going to be talking about entirely. I'm hoping there is some stories from the courtroom, some that are probably hilarious, some that are probably actually very sad, and then perhaps also some life principles and things that you've learned in, uh, in your years. Um, and I might, I might also say this. So I don't know how about all of you, but I struggle sometimes to know what does it look like to represent Christ on a daily basis. You know, sometimes, sometimes it might be pretty easy, and sometimes when, you know, things get rough, things get difficult, it's, it's hard. It's like, how do we represent Christ in our everyday work? And I don't necessarily have the answer to that, but I believe that by listening to each other's stories and encouraging each other on, it can be a great help. Um, so we also, <coughs> just before I, briefly before I uh, bring Jeff up here, uh, also very privileged to have another friend of mine, Mr. Don Hoover. Don, can you raise your hand? Don is my connection to Jeff. Don runs a monthly uh, BCN, Business Community Network Group in Lidditz, uh, which hopefully we'll get to hear a little bit more about that at the end of the meeting, if someone's interested in that. Um, so Don is uh, formerly an owner at Binkley and Hearst Farm Equipment, and um, like I said, Je Don has been my connection uh, to Jeff. Don's been a very dear friend of mine for the past six, seven years probably. So very grateful that you could make it, Don. And also, um, Don Don is very good at um, facilitating meetings. I've been to quite a few meetings where he's where he has done that, and he actually knows Jeff better than I do. So I told Don he has full permission to at any point during the meeting grab the second mic and say, "Hey, hold it there. Let's talk about that for a little bit, or let's you know whatever." So if Don starts jumping up and grabbing the mic, he has permission to do that. So, without further ado, please help me welcome Judge Jeffrey Conrad. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I am amazed that you all came out tonight with this weather. I honestly thought I'd be speaking to five or six people tonight. And, and seeing a packed house here tonight, I'm very impressed. So, as to each one of you that took on the, the, the task of coming out here to see anything, I'm very impressed already with each one of you. So, it's my pleasure to be here with you. I am Judge Jeff Conrad. Uh, those of you that voted in 2017, uh, that got out there and voted, you voted for me because I won. So, that's a great thing. Thank you very much for making me your judge. Uh, to the extent that uh, in this county, uh, we have 15 judges on the Court of Common Pleas. Now, many of you may run into magisterial district judges. They're your local DJ. So you might run into the DJ if you have, uh, you know, some kind of landlord-tenant situation. Uh, when it's under $12,000, you go see one of our DJs. And uh, we have 19 of those across the county. If you go to the DJ, and they also handle speeding tickets, if you go to the DJ, you don't get satisfaction and you want to appeal that, you appeal to the Court of Common Pleas, and that's where you would run into me. We are the trial court in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We have on our bench 15 judges. And so uh, we handle all of the trials, whether it be civil, uh, you know, jury trials, criminal, whatever it is, we take care of all of that. If someone decides to appeal any one of our decisions, it goes up then to the Superior Court, which is the appellate court here in Pennsylvania. And we have, uh, I think, 15 judges on our Superior Court. And if you're in an agency situation where you're not happy with the uh, Department of uh, Environmental Resources or something like that, if you appeal them, you appeal to the Commonwealth Court, and there are nine judges on that. And then, of course, if you don't like any of that, you want more satisfaction, you go the whole way to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and there there are seven justices, and you take your case there. So to the extent that now you know where I fit in the whole entire level, that's me. Now, one more thing as a disclaimer. Uh, I don't fit the role. I mean, I don't fit what a judge is supposed to look like. So <laughs> prior, to, prior to becoming a judge, of course, I was a practicing attorney, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But apparently, you're supposed to have little round glasses and a little belly and an attitude called robitis. And a lot of judges get robitis, and they think that, uh, well, they think that they may somehow be superior. 
And uh, I don't think I suffer from that. At least I'm trying very hard not to suffer from that because I try to walk as humbly as I can. And uh, as I talk with you this evening, I want you to also appreciate the fact that prior to becoming uh, a judge, I also served the United States Marine Corps. So sometimes some of the language that comes out of my mouth might be a little rougher. So any to the ladies in the house, I apologize in advance if I sound a little rougher. Not to be cussed or anything, but just that, you know, there's some terminology among men we have to use from time to time. So anyhow, that's a disclaimer from the very jump. So I may not always sound exactly like your normal judge, stuffy and all that. For me, it's about talking to men and talking to women and trying to be straight and trying to be direct and talking about truth. That's what I try to do in my career because I think there's not enough truth in the world. I don't know if any of you have ever been on the Internet, but there's a lot of stuff out there that ain't true. Now, I know that'll shock you. If anybody's ever read the newspaper, you'll be shocked to find out a lot of it ain't true. So uh, for me, I like truth because there's nothing worse than watching somebody come in my courtroom, put their hand in the Bible, swear to me or affirm that they're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and then lie their pants off. And does that happen? Yes, it does. Does it happen on a daily basis? Yes, it does. So I know that may be to you folks, but it's true. Now, to the extent that, even among this group here tonight, before I get started with all my comments this evening, I want to empower you. I want you to know this, that the court system is there to help you in your businesses. Now, a lot of folks in the playing community, they say, well, we don't want to go to law. Well, let me tell you something. It works for you. Come in. See us. We want to help you out. If you've been burned by somebody, you've been abused by somebody, we're there to help right, make, make things right. It's called justice, and I love to watch it. And does it happen in our court system? Yes, it does. Do you see on the news injustice? Yeah, you do. If you look at some of these jurisdictions around the United States, there's a lot of injustice going on out there. But we're doing a doggone good job here in Lancaster County of keeping things straight. You might have seen on the news out in California where people are just rolling into the, to, uh, convenience stores and stuff, filling up their arms and running out the door. Why? How is that happening? I don't understand it. All it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. And a lot of good men are doing nothing. Well, not so here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I can't tell you how many times I have somebody who's charged with retail theft, excuse me, and they come in front of me and they're like, Judge, what do you mean you're sending me to jail for this? I mean, out in California, they don't do that. I said, man, you broke the law in the wrong jurisdiction, man. You're going to jail. And so we have no problem sending people to jail to steal from you, okay? So if someone steals from you, by all means, make sure you bring it in. Contract disputes, if you need to come to law to get a lawyer to fix it for you, we will. A lot of people say, I don't want to go to a jury trial. I don't want to bring it into court. Here's the thing. A huge percentage. 90% of the civil cases settle before they ever get to court. The lawyers lock horns, they figure out what the law is on the situation, how to resolve it, and they work something out. It's a smart move. I represented, and I'll get into how I got there, but I represented a fellow uh, over in York County. He was an Amish man, called me into his place to try to help him out. A neighbor of his asked him, could he please, would, he, would the Amish fellow please help the neighbor buy a tractor? Okay, so the Amish fellow went down to the tractor store with him, and He's literally going to sign the paperwork. He's going to give the fellow the $28,000 to buy the tractor. And then he assumes that the fellow's going to pay him back because they're neighbors, right? They're neighbors. No contract, no nothing. He buys the tractor and puts it in the neighbor, Mr. Smith's name. Now, they take the tractor home, and lo and behold, Mr. Smith doesn't pay him. $28,000. Well, my Amish client keeps thinking the check's going to start coming in anytime he's a good neighbor. Of course he's going to pay him. No, he didn't pay him. And you know what? The fellow was out the money. There was no contract. As far as the law was concerned, he, he bought him a tractor. He did him a favor. It was, it was crazy to see it. And I said to the fellow at this point, well, I think you might have a case for something called unjust enrichment. Might be a way to come after this guy for what he did to you. He wouldn't do it. He would not do it. The only thing he asked me to do was write a letter to the guy. Would I write a nasty gram to the fella and say, please give me the money? Well, I felt very impotent doing that because that guy wasn't going to do it. No way. I sent the stupid letter. He gave me the big old thumb your nose and didn't do it. Of course he didn't do it. I hate seeing that kind of injustice. I hate it. That's why the courts are put there. It's okay. Bring it in. Get your DJ. 
you take a case in there, you don't like what you see, appeal it up to the court of common pleas. We'll take care of you. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll do exactly that. <clears throat> so anyhow, that gives you a little background. And I'll tell you this also. The last time I was down here at Shady Maple giving a presentation, it was before I became a judge. And I had to do with the kennels uh, that go on here in Lancaster County. A lot of kennel operators. Are there any kennel operators in the house here tonight? Anybody has got the... Uh, You are, are you? All right. Back in 2008, they changed the kennel law, and it really affected Lancaster County. You know, all the rage at that time was puppy mills, puppy mills, you know. And here I was, a practicing lawyer. I was going around the county meeting some of the puppy mills, and some of them were beautiful operations. Now, some of them were pretty skanky, no doubt. But for the most part, they were all very nice. And getting a chance to come down here to Shady Maple and address the, uh, the various, uh, uh, you know, plain community about uh, kennels was always great fun. And, uh, and when you're talking dog law, you always have to mention poop. And every time I mention poop, they brought down the house. Everybody's cracking up. All the children in, the, in there, they always got such a big kick out of that. But anyhow, that's all part of the dog law aspect. So I'm a judge on the court of common pleas. How does a knucklehead like me, how does a guy, Jeff Conrad, get to be judge here in Lancaster County? Well, let me give you some background of who I am and how I got down here. So I was born and raised up in Perry County, Pennsylvania which is just across the river from Harrisburg, straight across. Up there, the total population of the county up there was 41,000 people. Truly, more deer than people. So, that's where I grew up at. I was born back in 1966. My mom and dad uh, had to get married because I was in an accident. I got here a little too early, but uh, they got married and made it happen, and they lived in a little mobile home up on Fox Hollow Road in Perry County, Pennsylvania. I went to West Perry uh, School up there, and uh, I didn't think I was going to get a chance to do much of anything. My dad was an auto mechanic. My mother stayed home with, uh, with the three kids, which I was the oldest of. And I really had no idea what my life would be. When I was seven years old, I got a chance to meet a fella who was my uncle. He lived out in Boise, Idaho. And when I met my uncle, his name is Bud, when I met Uncle Bud, something was different about Uncle Bud. He walked differently. He talked differently. He carried himself differently. And I wanted to know what was special about him. Well, I found out that my Uncle Bud served the United States Marine Corps. He was one tough hombre. And I said to myself, you know what? When I grow up, I'm going to be a Marine. And so from that day on, from age seven, all I wanted to be was a Marine. So I went the whole way through high school. And <laughs> I didn't care much about high school because I knew as soon as I got that graduation diploma, I was leaving the Marine Corps. I was going to go to foreign lands. I was going to meet exotic people, and I was going to kill them. That's what I was going to do. <laughs> and that sounds terrible, but that was a slogan back in those days. A lot of t-shirts. That's what we were going to do. So uh, my mother had other plans for me. My mother did not want me to join the Marine Corps. She wanted me to go to college. She wanted me to be a college boy, get an education, be somebody. That's what she wanted. Nope, I want to join the Marines. So I joined the delayed entry program back when I was in high school. And at one point through my senior year, my mother and I had locked horns. We had a very big argument. Of course, anyone of you out there loves your mama, we've got to respect our mothers. That's what we're told to do. The Bible even says to do that. First Ten Commandments puts that in there. Got to respect your mother. We had a big argument. Long and short of it is, she wins. I'm supposed to go to college. But we struck a deal. I was going to go to college, but I was also going to join the Marine Corps and go through what's called officer candidate school and try to become an officer in the United States Marine Corps. So my high school yearbook, what's it say? What do you want to be when you grow up? United States Marine. So I joined the Marine Corps in officer candidate school, and I also enrolled in Shippensburg University to major in criminal justice. And so I went to Shippensburg, studied criminal justice, and between my junior or my freshman and sophomore year, I did a six-week training. And then between my junior and senior year, I did a six-week training with the Marine Corps. And having graduated all that and made it through, on graduation day in 1988, when everybody else is wearing their stupid gowns, uh, for graduation ceremony, I was in my Marine Corps dress uniform, and I got my gold bars pinned on, and I became a second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps. A life's ambition finally achieved. So, I leave uh, from the Marines <coughs> in the summer of 1989. I'm sorry, 1988. And uh, I had met a beautiful little blonde over in Carlisle, and I asked her to marry me, and she agreed. So my first training, I went down to Quantico, Virginia, to train as an infantry platoon commander. All Marines have to go to, it's called TBS, the basic school. We all have to go there. So I went down to the basic school to learn how 
to be an infantry platoon commander and how to take care of uh, platoons, uh, squads, platoons, and companies of men. So I did that for six months, learned how to be a Marine infantryman. During that time, I got a slot to go to flight school. Oh, can you imagine that? Flying the hottest birds in the United States Marine Corps, dropping bombs on bad guys. Oh, man, I was jacked up. I was ready to go, okay? So that's what I was going to do. So my wife and I got married on March 4th, 1989. And by the way, ladies, I picked March 4th because I figured I could remember that. Like I'm marching 4th in the Marine Corps, and I'm marching 4th in the marriage. So I thought that would work. And I've never forgotten one of, the, one of our uh, uh, anniversaries, so it worked out pretty good. So I married this pretty little blonde, and uh, her name is Kim, by the way. And we went down to uh, <coughs> Pensacola, Florida, where we trained for flight school. So the Navy guys and the Marine Corps guys, we all trained together. And so I was so excited about being a Marine. If any of you ever saw the movie Top Gun with Tom Cruise back in the 80s, not the new one, you know, for you young ones, the, the old one, okay, the old one. The old one, Tom Cruise had a hot motorcycle. So, of course, I'm in a Marine Corps, so, of course, I got to have a hot motorcycle. So, I bought a hot new motorcycle down there in Pensacola, Florida, because everybody had to have one. And I rode it for the first couple weeks until we started school. And then my, my flight class picked up on May 22nd, 1989. I, Jeff Conrad, went to the first day of flight school. And it was great. I loved it. Couldn't wait to get a chance to fly the Harrier jump jet, which was I was on track to fly that Harrier that jumps up and takes off. Oh. Couldn't wait to do it. Day two, the Navy guys had to get their physicals. And all the Marines had to do was work out. We called it PT, physical training. So I decided I'll take the motorcycle down to the base from Milton, Florida, down to Pensacola. That was my bright idea. So I get on the motorcycle, put all my gear on, had my Marine Corps uniform on, had my identification in my left breast pocket, totally, totally like I'm supposed to do. I leave the Milton base to get down to the Pensacola base. And I looked at my watch, and I'm like, oh, I got a whole hour to get to the base. No hurry. I pulled out, made a left-hand turn, started down the street. First gear, second gear, third gear, beautiful sunny morning, convenience store off to my right. A guy named Charlie Smith in a 71 Ford pickup truck with a wrought iron gate welded to the front decided that he was late to get his coffee and donuts over at the convenience store, so he drove right through the traffic and right over me. So I was hit on my second day of flight school by a 71 Ford pickup truck. I laid on the highway, my hand was folded back, my leg was back behind me, and I knew something was not right. I had seven fractures in my left hand, I had uh, numerous breaks in my left forearm, and I lost my left hip. I had three fractures in my left hip. I went from being a hard-charging, goal-oriented, one-focused guy to overnight being a crippled. I was instantly crippled. I was taken to the hospital, to a civilian hospital first, and the civilian doc, this is how haughty I was as a United States Marine Corps officer. The doctor comes walking in after seeing all the x-rays. He says, well, Lieutenant, I got good news and bad news. Literally, if you ever heard that, I mean, truly said this to me. The good news is you're going to live. The bad news is you're going to be crippled for life. And stupidly me, I look at the guy and I go, hey, I don't think you understand. I'm a United States Marine Corps officer. I will heal. <laughs> well, I didn't heal, okay? <laughs> the hip was totally destroyed. I was in the hospital for eight months. I had 12 surgeries. And at the end of the 12 surgeries, they had to amputate the top of the femur bone. And uh, I had no connection between my femur and my pelvis for seven years. Now, the story ends well because seven years later, in 1996, I got a new hip. So that's how Judge Conrad is walking around normally here today. But I spent the next seven years then as a cripple. I got to tell you, from going to be, being a hard-charging United States Marine Corps officer to being a cripple overnight is hard on the head, hard on the head. But I knew there had to be a reason for all this, so I played it cool. What did I do? I came home from the Marines. They retired me out. They did a line of duty investigation. It was the other guy's fault, so the Marine Corps backed me up. They promoted me to first lieutenant. They retired me out of the Marines at 22 years of age. Crazy. What do you do now when you got a criminal justice degree, so I could be a cop or something like that, but now I can't because I walk on a cane, and I couldn't do the one thing I always wanted to do, so what am I going to do? I came home. I had been reading the newspapers while I was in the hospital. 
and thinking about this, what should I do? So I decided I had seen that we needed some new county commissioners up in Perry County. Now, county commissioner is a big role. I didn't know anything about it. I just thought, hey, I'll go for it. Why not? I had no knowledge of politics. My family wasn't involved in politics, nothing. I grabbed a copy of the county code from our state representative. I read it cover to cover. It said all you had to be to be a county commissioner was 18 years of age and register to vote. That's me. So I'm like, I'm good. Let's do it. So I ran for county commissioner, and I won. I beat everybody. I ran it like a military campaign because I was fresh out of military school. So I ran it like a military campaign. I quadrant, uh, quadrant off the whole entire county, and then I just attacked all the voters. I just thought they were like bad guys. So I attacked all the voters and tried to get them to vote for me, and they did. So I won. So I was county commissioner. I did that for four years. Found out that being a county commissioner is for the birds. Um, I was 23 years old, and all the guys I was working with, they were 60 years old, and I was in sixth gear, and they were in first gear, and that just didn't work out. I just <laughs> couldn't do anything. And the, and, and the cardinal rule, I mean, the rule about politics is if you want to stay in politics forever, do nothing. Now, I'm sorry if there's any politicians in the house, and I apologize to you, but if you want to stay in forever, do nothing, because then there's nothing for anybody to criticize you for. If you do something, then you stuck your neck out, and now they can get you, okay? So, just saying. Now, I wanted to do everything, and they wanted to do nothing. So, anyhow, it wasn't for me. So, I had a, uh, our county solicitor, the, the lawyer, the lawyer said to me, you know, you should think about going to law school. And I'm like, law school? All I got's rocks up here. What are you talking about? He goes, no, no, no. I think you have a brain. You should go to law school. So, uh, all right. So I took the LSATs for law school. Turns out there was a brain up there. So I, I passed the LSATs, and I signed up for uh, law school and off to law school. So I was working during the day. I left, left county government, and I went to work in the private sector. So I went to work as a, uh, a marketer for a, an architectural firm and for a construction management company. And so I did that during the day, and then I went to law school at night. I had a wife, two babies, a mortgage, house, responsibilities. She was great. I worked my butt off, made it through, okay? So now here I was, 1999 I graduated, and now I've got a law degree and a criminal justice degree. And by that point, I had a new hip. So I'm walking normally. So now what do you do with all this? Well, I wanted to be a prosecutor. I wanted to take that law degree and be a prosecutor. Because I thought, what I'll do is, I'll go back and run for district attorney up there in Perry County. So being county commissioner, I had met Commissioner Terry Kaufman down here in Lancaster County at one point, at one of the county commissioner conferences. And Terry Kaufman contacted me, said, hey, I heard you got a law degree now. I said, yes. He said, we got a new district attorney down here, Don DeTaro. He said, why don't you come down and meet him? Ah. Perry County, that's a long drive. It's an hour plus to get down here. I thought that's kind of crazy. I drove down, though, to honor Terry. I thanked him for the opportunity. <clears throat> I met Don Totero, and we walked around the office. Until we got done walking around the office, he said, hey, how would you like to work for me? And I said, work for you? Yes, I'd love to, but i got to check with my wife. He goes, okay, you got to live here in Lancaster County, though, if you're going to do it. <clears throat> so I called the pretty little blonde up in Perry County, and I said, what do you think? Do you want to move down to Lancaster County? And she said, I'll have a for sale sign in the front yard before you get home. <laughs> and so that's exactly what we did. We sold the house up in Perry County. And just like the Clampets on the Beverly Hillbillies, we loaded up the truck and we moved to Lancaster County. So that's what we did. So I brought the wife and two kids down here to Lancaster County. I worked in the district attorney's office. I did that for seven years. And then after doing it for seven years, uh, I decided to switch over and do defense work. And I'll get to more of that later on, what happened with that. But I switched over to doing defense work in 2007. Actually, on April the 1st, April Fool's Day, 2007. So the only, the only law firm I could think of to join that I liked was a guy named Jim Clymer. I don't know if anybody's ever come into contact with Jim Clymer. Super lawyer, good guy. And so I asked about having an opportunity to work for him. He gave me that opportunity, and I started doing defense work. And uh, I got a chance to do everything from... Uh, Speeding tickets, just like I did in, in the DA's office, everything from speeding tickets to homicide cases. And I did the same thing, including death penalty cases, as the defense attorney. And then in 2017, as I started with all this, I ran for the bench, and all you folks decided that that crazy guy with a big mouth might be a good judge. You took a big risk, but you did the right thing. <laughs> so now I serve as your judge. So. All that to say, that's what brought me here to Lancaster County. And that's what got me uh, working as your judge here in Lancaster County. And do I like the work? I love the work. I love it. When I first came on the bench back in 2018, I took a bench in uh, January, they put me over in family court. So I got a chance to do family court. And then from family court, 
I switched over to doing, uh, to doing criminal work, and now I do the, the criminal trials. Now, all that story, what I just laid out for you is the path, so kind of the physical path that I took from being a boy on Fox Hollow Road with parents that got married very young, living in a mobile home, to being in Lancaster County and being a judge. Now, for me, I, I can't tell you how appreciative I am of that. But there is one reason why that happened and why it worked. It's because the path, crooked as it was that I was on as I looked forward, if I look back, is a straight line right back to the day that I met Jesus Christ. And I met Jesus Christ in a big way when I was 15 years old under a dam up on Sherman's Creek in Perry County, Pennsylvania. I was in ninth grade, 10th grade, whatever it was, and I was studying evolution. And as we're studying evolution, I started buying into this crap that maybe, I'm sorry, uh, philosophy. I started buying into this philosophy that um, an evolution could be true because they were so convincing on it, right? You know, we, we were squishing the dirt, and then we evolved up through it, and then we became man. Oh, gag me now. Anyhow, so I was uh, believing that stuff at that time. And at that time, I was all into working out and stuff. And it was March, uh, just like we're having right now, a great big number of uh, days of rain. So the water was super high. And my old man says to me, hey, how would you like to go for a canoe ride down the creek? Heck yeah, Dad, I'm with you. So we're going to go for a canoe ride and a flood-stayed creek. And Dad's rationale was, it'll be faster. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm good. So um, we get in a canoe. It's not even our canoe. I had borrowed my Uncle Bud, the Marine. We had borrowed his uh, aluminum Grumman canoe. And so we're going to get down Sherman's Creek in March, freezing cold, canoeing. So we're going down the creek, and we got to a low head dam. Now, the dam didn't look like much on a regular day, but on this day with flood stage waters, it was all that. I mean, it was crushing. The water was crushing over the top of the dam. And my old man says to me, what do you want to do? Do you want to get out or do you want to shoot the dam? Well, let's shoot the dam, Dad. Let's go. So we're going to shoot the dam. So uh, here's this guy, uh, you know, 14 years old, and his dad, who's only you know, like 31 or 32 at that point. And so my old man can't even swim. We both had life jackets on. So now we're getting closer and closer to the edge of the dam. And as we're getting there, it's getting loud. I mean loud, like the water's crashing, you know. And so as we get close to it, the old man chickens out, and he says, back paddle. Well, there ain't nothing. You're not back paddling at that point. You're going over, okay? So did we go over? Yes, we went over. And as we're going over, I'm even thinking to myself, no big deal. We'll splash in the frothy water. I'll swim to the side. No big deal. We'll pick up the canoe farther down the creek. Well, uh, if anybody knows anything about low head dams, there's a little thing called hydraulic. As the water goes over, it back turns. So you'll see a log that will go over a dam and won't come out for a day because it's laid underneath there just back churning, okay? Does that happen? Oh, yes, it does. Have I been there? Oh, yes, I have. So I jumped out of that canoe as we went over, and I thought for sure, no problem, I'd swim away. Unfortunately, when I hit that water, I got sucked right to the bottom right now. And I mean to tell you, I was just getting beat up. I was being log rolled. My face is hitting rocks. I would come up, grab air, and get sucked right back down. I thought I was done. So here's this little smart aleck, 15-year-old, who thinks he has all the answers. And that evolution ain't doing a stinking thing at that point. Those squishy bugs in the dirt, evoluting up through whatever they do, nope, not having a bit of effect on this. The only thing that was going to help me at that point was a guy named Jesus Christ. And I literally, as I'm underneath that stinking dam, I said, Jesus, save me. And even, if I, even as I say that today, you know, it's, it's embarrassing to think that when you think you're all that on your own, you think you can do everything on your own. You can't do anything on your own, but you can do everything with him. And uh, I went down and came up, and I popped right out of that thing. And I looked back, and here's my dad still going under and still coming up, still going under, still coming up. I thought dad was already dead. I got beached on a corner, and I'm praying, God, save my dad too. And my dad came popping out. <laughs> he came down on the same side of the beach, the same side of the creek. We were both joyous that we had lived. 
and we later got a chance to both share our stories, and he had an exact, exact similar situation. Uncle Bud's canoe was found two miles downstream after the flood was over, ripped in half. It had ripped the whole way through. An aluminum Grumman canoe ripped the whole way through. Can you imagine the power of that water? My dad had called the boat commission to report the accident, and the boat commission just laid into my old man, like, how stupid could you be going over a dam like that? All that to say is that God in his providence knew at that point it was time to bring me home, and he did. And I am saved by his grace right there on the spot. Now, how does that affect then the rest of my life? Well, I told you about a little motorcycle accident that I had. Here's the backside of the motorcycle story. I was hit by Charlie Smith on Tuesday morning, May 23rd, at 0630 hours. That same convenience store where I was hit, two nights earlier on Sunday evening, I used to always take our cars down and fill them up at the gas station. I was a new lieutenant. My wife was a new nurse. We bought toys. I had a brand new Pontiac Firebird formula. It was hot. I had a brand new motorcycle. It was hot. We had a brand new Toyota Celica. It was hot. I had all kinds of cool stuff at that point. I'm gassing up the formula, and on the other side of the pumps pulls up a 71 Ford pickup truck. And as I'm on my side of the pumps filling up my car, gospel truth, I literally prayed, and I said, God, why is it that I've got so many things going for me today? And why is it that man appears to have nothing? And two days later, that man changed the course of my entire life. When Charlie Smith hit me, it turned me from being a guy that thought he was all that in a bag of chips. even saved at that point. I still thought I was all that. And it made me a cripple overnight. <coughs> Literally. I had uh, eight surgeries. My body was scarred from the big uh, incisions that I have uh, cut in my side to try to do the surgeries. Eight surgeries later, like I said, they retired me out of the Marines. Now what am I going to do? There's a verse that for me is very important, and it's something that I cling to with all my heart and soul because it meant something to me that day, and it means something to me now. And Paul wrote it to the Corinthians when he was talking to them. He says this in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Mine wasn't a thorn, but it was a hip that was now gone. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Ladies and gentlemen, did I spend time on my knees asking God to heal me? You bet I did. But that wasn't what he had in store. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Man, for a Marine to read that, I went, what? What are you saying to me, God? What do you mean? <clears throat> Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Woo! Man, did I love hearing that. I loved hearing that. And I started thinking about that. And I started thinking, all right, God, I don't know what this is all about. I don't know what you're doing to me, but I'm cool with it. You know why? Because I'm yours. And I know all things can be done through you. I'm going to play this cool. While I was literally in the Marines, while I was laying in the hospital that year, they came in to see me because a lot of guys, when they lose their flight slot, think about committing suicide. So they brought the suicide team in to talk with me. They're like, hey, Lieutenant, are you thinking about killing yourself? And I'm like, kill myself for what? I got other things to do, man. I serve a risen Savior. Cool. That was the last time I had to see that shrink, and they started bringing these young men into me. So these guys that were getting hurt, they would bring them, because I was in for eight months, so they'd bring them in for me to counsel them to try to give them hope. Man, I like that job. That was good for me. So was God using me in that role? Yes, he was. Was I happy to do it? And the other thing was, I didn't mind telling the commanders. Like, when they were asking me, you know, why are you like this, you nut? Why, why are you so confident? I'm like, because I got, I got Christ in my heart. I'm good to go. And they thought that was crazy. But to the world, we sound foolish. But to him, ah, it's all good, right? So it was great to be used in that way. Absolutely great. <laughs> I got a chance then, I told you about, to come home and be a, uh, I lost some weight, by the way, too. 
I lost 25 pounds uh, this year because I went on a carnivore diet since the beginning of the year. So now I'm all in the gym all the time, so now my suits fit light. Anyhow, um, so I told you about coming home to the Marine Corps, from the Marine Corps then and becoming a county commissioner. Was God in that? Was I able to take God into the county courthouse? Could I do that? Well, Mr. Conrad, Judge Conrad, you can't mix church and state. Ah, you're right. You can't mix church, mix church and state. But when we started off here tonight, I was talking to you about truth and the fact that truth is a principle that can't be snuffed out. And it doesn't matter if you're not allowed to proclaim Jesus in your actual workspace, you can always talk truth, and truth equals Jesus because that's justice, okay? So did I mind doing that? I did not. But i got to tell you a story. So when I was county commissioner at the ripe old age of 23, 24 years old, we had a judge, okay, my same level that I am today, we had a judge named Judge Keith Quigley, who was our president judge up in Perry County. And Judge Keith Quigley had also served in the United States Marine Corps. So he and I were a kindred spirit, right? Well, just after I became county commissioner, the new young county commissioner up in Perry County, there was an after-hours beer party in the courthouse. A literal after-hours beer party in the courthouse. Well, I come in, I don't know anything about this, and someone, I came in on, a, on a, whatever morning it was, and someone said, hey, commissioner, there was a beer party in the courthouse last night. There's still booze up on the second floor on the shelves and stuff where people were drinking and just setting their things down. And I'm like, well, that can't happen. i got to put a stop to this. So I decided to go marching up to see the president judge, me, 20, 24 years old, and I'm going to have a talk with the president judge about how this can't happen anymore if he's allowing this to happen. It can't happen. Now, for any of you that are career-minded individuals, it probably ain't the best move to go lay into the president judge. But I had something from the Marine Corps called a little more kahunas than brains against <laughs> talking men talk. Um, and so my kahunas got the best of me, and I decided to go see the president judge. So I walked in to see the president judge, and I said, sir, i got to have a chat with you because you can't have any more beer parties in this courthouse while I'm county commissioner. <laughs> president judge got up, walked over, and he shut the door. Then he came back over, <laughs> and he said, boy, I'm going to tell you something. Don't you ever tell me how to run my courthouse again. And number two, if you're going to be good at this job, you better learn how to blink. Cover a blind eye. So me, being the smart aleck I was at that point, I said, Judge, let me tell you two things. One, in the United States Marine Corps, they didn't teach me how to blink. And two, don't ever call me boy. <laughs> He threw me out. He's like, get out now. Get out. So I got out. So the president judge and I, we got off on a bad start. Right, it was a bad start. Now, the good thing about being county commissioner was, was God with me at that point? Yeah, because great things happened. Even though I didn't like that job, while I was on that job, I got a chance to meet the county solicitor who I told you about. And he saw something in me, and he thought I could be, that I would be able to be uh, a lawyer. And so he gave me that encouragement. And even that president judge that I tangled with, three years later, he was willing to write me a letter of reference. And he noted in my letter of reference for law school about the strong character that he was able to see in me. <laughs> Hang on just one second. Hang on just one second. Here, grab this. <laughs> now, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now, I mentioned to you also, after I got done being county commissioner, that I got a chance to go down here to meet the DA, to become uh, part of the district attorney. And how are we doing time-wise? we cool? We're still good. We're still good? Okay. All right. Good. All right. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. So now, here's this young county commissioner, and I had met this guy, Terry Kaufman, who was the county commissioner down here. And he brought me on board to meet Don Tatero, and as I told you, I took the job, and my, my wife and I moved down here. Now. Back at that time, we were just really starting to find out how badly the internet was being abused and how people were getting online and doing horrible things in terms of looking at pornography and in terms of looking at child pornography. And right now, among the brothers and the ladies, just to be clear, every time I'm among the brothers, I always make sure to share this because it grabs all of us. Right now, I'm telling you, if you're dealing with a porn addiction in your lives, right now, you need to knock it off. If any one of you is dealing with that, knock it off now. It's not healthy. It's not good. 
it leads to evil. I'm just telling you. So if anyone is just dealing with that, I want you to talk with your, with your pastor, with your bishop, with a good friend, whoever it takes. Make sure you deal with that. But here I was now as a new assistant district attorney, and I was asked at one point to handle all the sex crimes prosecution in Lancaster County. Now, I love the Lord Jesus. I've told you guys about that. And now the eyes, the eyes that I look to my Lord with, the mouth that I'm to praise my Lord with, I have to now talk wretched things every day. I have to go to work at that time. The, the police would do investigations. They would find the files on people's, on, on people's home computers. They would do search warrants. They would bring those files in. And then I had to look at every one of the files, every one of the images, to check off if it was a child or not. Because if it was a child, it was another count of felony pornography, child pornography, which is a felony. The first day I did this, I'll tell you all, I'll never forget it. I looked at 1,200 wretched, filthy images on the first day. I was mortified that men and women in our society would do the things to children. I became righteously angry about it. But I also felt filthy having seen it. I went home that night to a home that I worked very hard to make sure it was pure. And my baby girls, my two baby girls and my wife, I worked very hard to try to have a pure home. I, I didn't even think I'd be able to walk through the front door because I felt filthy. I felt dirty. And the little blonde I told you about, I, stayed, I was standing at the door. And she's like, what's your deal? Why aren't you coming in? I said, baby, I, I, I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling poorly tonight. And she came out. And she said, what were you doing? And I told her what I had to do that day. And she said, bend down. So I bent down. And she kissed both my eyes. <laughs> and she said to me, did you ask God to forgive you? I said, I did. And she said, well, then, you're forgiven. Get in this house. And so I did. And it caused me that day to literally come up with a plan that every time I was going to be asked by the police to look over those images again, which there had to be many more times, one, I was going to pray that God would give me a Teflon brain, but two, I was going to pray Ephesians 6. And I literally started a habit of reading Ephesians 6 where I put on the armor of Christ, literally. And I'm telling you guys, I literally put it on in order to walk in there and see those images. And I can tell you today that I have victory over that. I mean, I do. I have, I have victory over it. I don't, I'm not haunted by those images. They came in and they went. And to this day, I still have to do those kind of cases as a judge. It's very difficult. But that's why I like to share with men when we get together, that we men have to hold each other accountable. And so when these kind of things are going on, don't be afraid to ask your buddy, hey, do you have trouble with that kind of stuff? Because if you are, I want you to talk to me about it, okay? So don't be afraid. This gentleman, I'm sure, is not. But anyhow, I'm just saying, make sure to do that with your friends because you should. I wanted to tell you about one other story that the, and again, time-wise, I'm not, so, okay, all right. I got to tell you one more story from the courtroom. All right, this is always good. A true story. And again, we're talking truth. If I tell you something, it's right on, okay? So I'm not, I don't even have to exaggerate. This stuff is cool. It happens all the time. When you let God control your life, when you let God have, have the reins, cool stuff happens. So we were doing a sex crime case where a young lady had been molested. She was uh, 16 years old. Uh, she was having a, uh, a friend over on New Year's Eve. So she had her friend who was also 16 years over, uh, old over at the house. While they're there, the mother and stepfather went out on New Year's Eve. The stepfather became intoxicated. And when they came home, the girls stayed home. The father and mother went out. The girls were home. When the girls were just going to bed as the father was coming home, the daughter was in the restroom. The girlfriend that was staying over was in bed. When the drunk father came up the steps, he went into the bedroom and assaulted the friend. Dad leaves and went to his room. The friend was shocked that this happened. She told the daughter about this right away. And the next day, police were, were uh, involved and charges were filed against this man. Okay, So he was... He was charged with this crime of assaulting the daughter's friend. So now we went to trial on this, a jury trial, and in front of one of our judges, just before we went to make closing arguments, all the evidence is in. Everything's in from the Commonwealth's case. Everything's in from the defense case. And now it's time for the jury to make a decision on this. The defense attorney made a motion that I couldn't discuss in the closing argument the fact that the father had been intoxicated. What? I couldn't believe it. And I'm looking at the judge like, what are you talking about? They called it a prior bad act, him being intoxicated. And I couldn't talk about him being intoxicated during the trial. 
or during the closing argument. And the judge said to me, Mr. Conrad, if you bring that up, I will report you to the disciplinary board. I'm real bad at no. I, I'm, I'm real bad at someone telling me I can't do something. And I'm real, real bad at taking no for an answer. So I'm back at my table. And I'm waiting to get a chance to do my closing argument. So the defense attorney gets up, because in Pennsylvania, the defense attorney closes first. So the defense attorney gets up, and he spews his round of lies about why the jury should find this guy not guilty. I'm sorry. He made his case why they should find this guy not guilty. And so it was going to be my turn next. And I'm seething. I can't believe this judge just did this to me. I can't believe he's not going to let me say this. So my prosecuting police officer sitting right next to me. And now it's time for me to close. And I'm praying. I'm begging God to give me a solution to this. And then it came to me. So I'm seated at council table. <clears throat> Mr. Conrad, you may close. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, opposing counsel, members of the jury. On January 1st, on January 1st, that guy right there came in the front door. And then he walked up the steps. And when he got to the top of the steps, he went in that bedroom. And he molested that young lady. Ladies and gentlemen, you may absolutely find him guilty on the facts here today. Thank you. And I sat down. I never said it. I never said it. I never said drunk. I never said it. That judge was fuming. There was nothing he could do to me. Nothing. If you read that record, the record was pure, man. I didn't say it at all. They convicted that guy like an hour. It was good. It was really good. <laughs> so it was great fun doing that. Now, you switch gears. So I, I, in 2007, uh, my boss, Don Tataro, ran for the bench. He became Judge Tataro. And so I didn't want to work for the next guy. I thought about running, but the doors just didn't line up uh, for me to run for DA. So I decided to go into uh, defense work. And so I went to see Jim Clymer because he was the only Christian lawyer that I knew of. And I'm sure there are others, but he's all I knew of. And I said to him, hey, I'd like to start a, a criminal defense practice. I'd like to go on the other side and, and help out people that have been, you know, unjustly charged and, you know, try to help you out or, you know, just I, I'm addicted to the courtroom. I want to get a chance to do it. So Mr. Clymer gave me the opportunity to do it. And I literally prayed <clears throat> that God would give me people to help out. But I also prayed this prayer, <clears throat> that I wasn't going to judge anybody. If you came through the door to our, our law firm, that meant God brought you to me. That's how I was going to view it. And so no matter what it was, if you were innocent, we'd argue innocence. If you were guilty, we're going to try to get you the best deal for what you did. That's how I was going to handle it. And people said to me, you can't have that as a business model. If you have that as a business model, you will fail. And I said, I don't care, because I think it's a winning business policy, and I'm going to do it. And so we did it, and I'm going to tell you all this, and just to give you encouragement in your businesses. My business thrived from the day I went over there with his firm. A year later, Mr. Clymer made me uh, a partner in the law firm. That's how good things went. So will God honor that? Yes, he will. But i got to tell you one more story. <clears throat> and that goes to the guy I had to defend one time. And my buddy Don Hoover over here knows this story. And it's one that has forever stuck with me. Again, gospel truth. I told you about the child pornographers. I told you about how much it makes me seethe. But now as a defense attorney, what happens if I have to defend one of them? Oh, well, I started off by saying from the moment I opened the doors, I committed to myself that whoever was brought through the door, God wanted me to try to help. Now, that is a tall tale sometimes. I got a call up in the federal middle district because I was on a list up there to handle defense cases. And the, uh, the court asked me to come up to Harrisburg to handle a case. Well, when the federal judge makes a phone call and wants a lawyer, I'm good to go. So I jumped in my car and went racing up to Harrisburg to handle this case that I was going to get. Along the way, I got a call from my staff. And they said, hey, Jeff, uh, you ain't going to like what you're getting into. And I said, how's that? They said, the case that they're calling you up there to defend is a child pornography case. Ugh. I did not want to do it. I'm telling you, didn't want to do it. Driving up there the whole way, now I got an attitude. And in addition to my attitude, I had a brand new Dodge Charger, burnt orange, custom wheels, hot car. Okay, I just bought it. Just bought it. And it's in July. It's hot. So the car is hot, but it's hot outside physically. 
So I get up there to federal court, and I'm not kidding you. As I opened up the door to go into the courtroom to meet my client for the first time, a whiff of body odor just rolled out of the courtroom. And I look over to the chair I'm about to go to, and in my chair over there is a 450-pound man with a gigantic tumor on his belly. So not only was his belly big, then his belly got bigger because of the tumor. And he reeked, he reeked of body odor. And I find out that's my client. That's the child pornography guy. So I go over and I sit down next to him. And it's an initial appearance when you first get appointed to a case. So I had to argue to the judge why this fella, Mr. Cooper, should be released on bail pending his trial. Now I'm thinking there's no way the judge is going to let this guy out. But i got to make an argument. That's what I'm called to do as a defense attorney. I stood up. I made the argument, and for whatever reason, the judge granted it and said that he could have bail to send him home waiting trial. So now the sheriff or the deputies, uh, the marshals, they unlock him, and now he's going to be released on bail. Now he's got to find his way home from Harrisburg back to Lebanon. I had a brand new car. I had a brand new phone, and I don't want this guy touching nothing I've got. So I'm like, oh, Lord, please don't test me today. Please don't, don't test. Not today. Please don't test me. I said to the guy, hey. Uh, you need to use my phone to make a call? No. Well, I said, you want to make a call? He says, no, ain't got no phone. I said, well, you want to use my phone to call a friend? Ain't got no friends. I said, well, you got money to call a taxi? Ain't got no money. Oh, man. I'm like, all right, I'll drive you home. So right outside of the courtroom, there were some boxes. I took one of the boxes and I tore it. Went down to my car and I laid boxes on my seat. And I said to him, sit on those boxes and don't touch nothing. So he sits down on there, and we get in my car. Now it's July, and it's hot. And so I got the windows down. I got the air conditioning cranking. And I got my head out like this, and I got hammered down. Now, you're not supposed to speed. <laughs> we were rolling, because I'm going to get this guy home as fast as I can get him home. And as we're driving down the road, I mean, as we're going down the highway. I was convicted like I have never been convicted, and I did not like it. Um, I'm thinking to myself, as much as I hate this, that guy sitting next to me is a child of God. That guy sitting next to me needs to know Jesus just like I do. Oh. Oh. And the question is, could I bring myself to talk about my Lord and Savior to this guy. Ugh! And I was so convicted, I had to do it. And so it would have been the worst witness you've ever heard. So as we're driving down the road, my, my, I said this. I go, so where are you at with God? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was not in a good place at that point. But anyhow, I, I started the conversation. And uh, the conversation went on. And we talked and we talked. And over the, I got a Bible for him. And over the course of the next six months, Mr. Cooper came to an understanding of Jesus Christ. And at his sentencing, Mr. Cooper got 12 years. Listen to me. He got 12 years. He deserved every bit of the 12 years that he got. Okay? So don't get me wrong. Did I do my job? Yeah, because he was facing 20. <laughs> I got him 12. Okay? But he, he, did he need to go to jail? Yes, he did. And he did. But at his sentencing... He told the judge that his eyes had been opened after reading the Bible. His eyes were opened to the sin that he was doing. That's a cool thing. Mr. Cooper went off to federal prison. The following summer, I got a call from the marshals. Mr. Cooper died in prison of a massive cerebral hemorrhage. I didn't like Mr. Cooper, but I had to love him. And now I know when I leave this planet, I'm going to see him in glory. And he's not going to be a 450-pound child pornographer. He's going to be washed in the blood, standing there with all of us. So can you, can, you, can you bring Jesus into your job? Yes. Can you do it? You can. You just have to go ahead and follow that leading, even when you don't want to do it. And just so I don't take up too much of your time here tonight, I'm going to share one more for you. And we're still good? Got time for one more? One more? Okay. <laughs> Very kind. Now, so now, so now I, I gave, you, gave it to you. As a prosecutor, brought him into doing defense work. 
Can you bring them into the courthouse? Oh, now that's a challenge. Because separation of church and state, and if your judge gets up there and starts proselytizing the people, well, then they'll report me to the ethics board. Then I'll be in front of the ethics board. Then I'll get kicked out of office, and you guys will all think terrible of me, right? So, because that's all you hear about in the paper. So I can't proselytize directly. But while I'm on the bench, like we talked about, can we talk about truth? Oh, yes, we can. And if somebody in the courtroom happens to bring up the fact that they're a person of faith or that they're a lover of Jesus, well, then I can follow up on that, you see? I can't bring it up, but I can follow up. And boy, do I ever. But anyhow, um, so we had a case coming up. I was doing family court. Now, if you guys have ever heard of Barbie and Ken dolls, little dolls, right, little dolls, Barbie and Ken. Barbie's all cute and perfect. Ken's all cute and perfect, right, Barbie and Ken. Now, everybody in your life has a Barbie and Ken in their life. Now, it might be uh, Jakey and Sarah, but one way or the other, it's a Barbie and Ken, okay? So everybody's got a Barbie and Ken. So we had a court case where Barbie and Ken, perfect as they are, they make a perfect little boy. And now, Barbie and Ken, after their perfect little boy is five years old, Barbie and Ken uh, start not liking each other anymore. And so Barbie runs out, and she finds a new Ken. And Ken runs out, and he finds a new Barbie. And now they want to come to court, and they want to argue as to who gets custody of this precious little boy. And they hired the best attorneys in the county, and they were ready for a fight, and I was the judge that day. Now, in child custody cases, there are 16 custody factors that we have to go through. Communication, their homes, how things are. But one of the questions we have to talk about is, who do they like spending more time with? Who would they rather be with? Now, I knew this little five-year-old boy was coming in. What can you get out of a five-year-old? He's five. Whoever brought him in the door last is who he loves the most, right? That's, that's how things are at that age. And you have to take that into consideration. But I was begging God. I was begging God on this one. Because the two people were decent human beings, kind of, except in their relationships. But as a mother and a father, they were good mommies and daddies. What am I going to do? How am I going to divide this child up? It was going to be a big decision. So I'm begging God. And for those of you who have ever heard of you know, uh, uh, Solomon's prayer, where he asked God for wisdom, I literally pray uh, that prayer all the time. I ask God to give me discernment to judge his people for who, you know, who am I to do this. So anyhow... We got in there, Barbie comes in the door, dressed to the nines, has a seat on the plaintiff table. Ken comes in, dressed to the nine, has a seat at the defense table. Then their high-powered attorneys came in, and then the new Barbies and Kens came and sat in the back. And so I said, hey, we're going to do things differently today for the trial. I decided that we were going to interview the child first, and then we'd interview the parents later. So Grandma brought the little five-year-old in. A little five-year-old comes in, he's standing at the bar right in front of me. He didn't even come up to the top of the bar. And I introduced myself to him, and I said, hey, buddy, we're going to take you back in my chambers and have a chat back in my chambers. So instead of doing it in front of the parents, you take the children in the back in the chambers, bring the attorneys back there, it reduces the stress on the child. So we took this little guy back into my chambers, and I talked to this little guy. I asked him what it was like living over at mommy's house. I asked him what it was like living over at daddy's house. I talked about his best food, what's he like at both places. But then I had to get to the ultimate question, and I had to say to him, all right, now, pretend you're a piece of pie, and i got to divide you up between mommy and daddy. What should I do? H how should I divide you up? This is a five-year-old response from a five-year-old. This kid leans back in his chair, puts his finger like this, and says, let me think. <laughs> I'm looking at this kid like, what's this going to be? And he goes, hmm. I think I'd ask God. I said, little guy, that's a good response. So I took him back out in the courtroom. I sent him back out the door with Grandma. Had Barbie and Ken sitting there with the new Barbie and Ken's in the back. I took him through all the responses the child had given. And then the last one, I told him what the child had said. I let God decide. Boom, tears. Barbie starts crying, Ken starts crying, new Barbie starts crying, new Ken starts crying, everybody's crying. They decided to all stand up, go out in the hallway, and they worked out a deal to share that child. I didn't have to touch it. They worked it out, case was over right there, case dismissed. Good stuff, you guys. I'll tell you, when you watch the power of God 
move through a five-year-old child like that. Woo! I mean, that's good stuff. Love to watch it happen. Get a chance to see these kind of things happen every day in these courtrooms here in Lancaster County. So is God alive and at work in the courtrooms here? I would say to you, yes. Can you figure out ways to creatively bring your God, your Savior, into that livelihood that you have? You bet. Are there ways that you can be asking God on every day of what you're doing in your business? How can you relate with this person? If there's opportunities, if there's doors that open up, you're praying about it and doors open up, don't be afraid to drive a Mack truck right through that door and speak to that heart that's in need. I would encourage every one of you to do it. One more verse that just stands out to me that I absolutely love, might be my life verse. It's Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope if I've done nothing for you tonight is to encourage you to not be afraid. Not be afraid to do that task that God's asked you to do and to be courageous in your businesses. And if something goes wrong, take it to God. And if he wants you to come into the courthouse, get on into the courthouse. We'll help you out, okay? There's good people in there ready to help you out. Don't be afraid. So with that, I'll close. God bless all of you. Sir. Now, my brother Don Hoover that many of you might know here, Don Hoover and I got a chance to meet through this BCN uh, uh, network that we have. And we get a chance to see people bringing and infusing Christ into their workplace. And that's how I met this guy. And watching these dudes with these, with these amazing businesses and how they figure out how to do it and how God blesses them. It was great for me to see. And I'm just a little knucklehead from Fox Hollow Road in Perry County. And I get a chance to do my job in the courtrooms working for you guys. But, but you guys are business people. And that's what he is, was, now retired. But he's on fire for the Lord. And it's great to be around him just in his, his sphere of influence. We call it an oikos, you know, that sphere of influence. So anyhow, great to be around you and great to be with you tonight. Thank you very much. Yay, God. Yay, God. Yay, God. And all the stories. Um, you guys think he was fired up tonight. You ought to hear him before 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it's really nuts. Bless you, man. Just really appreciate Jeff a lot. And for every story he told us, there would be 10 that he could have told us. Most of us are not judges. I don't know if there's another judge in the room tonight. But we all have something that we can do to steward what God has put in us. One of my favorite scriptures is, 2 Corinthians 2, and for those of you who are in the room, uh, you will know this, but 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14 says, we know that God is always leading us in victory or in triumph. God is always leading us in victory. And through us, he diffuses the fragrance of the knowledge of himself in all places. That stinky guy he was talking about had not an aroma, he had an odor. But we are supposed to carry the essence of Christ. And these are not some, this is not some good idea that we found on the internet. This is something that the Apostle Paul wrote saying, we know, we know. There's a lot of things we don't know, but we know that God is always leading us in victory. Not once in a great while, not Tuesdays and Sundays. He is always leading us in victory in Christ. And those victories look don't look like victories all the time. And again, great stories this evening. He's always leading us in victory in Christ. And through us, he diffuses the fragrance of the knowledge of himself. Uh, my stories would not be probably as colorful as what Jeff's are. But I could stand up here and tell you stories till breakfast of where we're seeing God do what only God can do through po people who are aligned with his word and empowered by his spirit and are seeing a difference made. I'm just going to give you one example um, real quickly, and that would be back in, because it pertains to many of us in the room, <clears throat> back in 2000, um, one day I got a, an envelope at our business, and it was from a correctional facility up in central Pennsylvania. And so I gave it to my dad, and I said, I don't know what that is. Please check it out. So he wrote to an inmate that was about to come out of the correctional system, and um, he had he had 
committed a crime and had paid his dues. And so we went up there and picked him up and uh, brought him home. I got him a job at a local dairy. And as we're coming home, I will never forget this. As we're coming home, I said, Lester, I'm amazed. How in the world did you get a hold of us? And he said, well, in the prison library, there was a Lancaster Farming. And when I told the publisher of Lancaster Farming this story, and again, I'm telling you the truth, he was sitting there crying so bad, his, his, the tears were running in his soup. We were sitting in a restaurant down there after that. There was a Lancaster Farming in the prison library, God using everyday run-of-the-mill stuff. All of us look at Lancaster Farming at one time or another in a month. He said, I went through, I wrote 89 letters took the advertising section and I flipped through and I took eight, I wrote 89 letters saying, surely, this is what he said, he said, surely one of those church people are going to care enough about me to give me a job. I want to start over. I said, wow, you wrote 89 letters and he's naming names, the Zimmermans, the Hershey's, the Martins, the Binkley, ours was Binkley and Hearst. I said, you wrote 89 letters. He said, yep. I said, well, even there, how did you decide then to choose us over the others? He said, it's not hard to choose when you only get one back. <laughs> None of us, so many of us, I mean, it was, it, that doesn't make me special. It makes me blessed to have those opportunities, and all of us would have those. And I know many of you could stand up here and give similar stories. So, Jeff, thank you so very, very much. It's, it's truly inspirational, is it not? How about another nice hand for the Lord? <laughs> doing what he's doing through Jeff. I would love, if it's okay, I would love to lead us in a prayer. Is that okay for us to pray? I would love for us just to pray and, and uh, well, I'll see what the Lord shows me if that would be okay. <coughs> Father, one of the names that is given to your son Jesus is that he is the Redeemer. And so I thank you this evening for the amazing stories that Jeff is able to stand up here and share. And many of us can embrace and realize that this is not something that is common in terms of the specifics of the illustration, but Lord, your love reaches to and through each one of us. Lord, I pray tonight that you would release a special unction from the Holy Spirit, which would have us all go away here, regardless where we are on the continuum of life, on our journey, Lord, that you would give fresh inspiration, that you would give us capacity to grasp in a new way the reality that it is indeed through us that you exude the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ himself. Your word says that before Jesus returns, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Christ. So, Lord, we know that we're in these amazingly exciting times and that Christ in us is the only hope that we have for that glory. Lord, let us not be selfish. This area is known for its generosity, for its philanthropy. Lord, let this group tonight and many, many others throughout the community who are following you be the ambassadors for Christ, be the representation of Jesus and his love. Thank you for that convicting work of Holy Spirit, and we free you to do it here in this place tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Don, would you mind telling us, you want to talk a little bit about the BCN? Are you, are okay, you? so Jeff referenced BCN, and there's a bunch of you guys. Raise your hand if you've ever been to a BCN gathering. So you know, there's, a new, there's a bunch of you here. Um, uh, back in the, uh, I don't know, about 20 years ago probably, I began to explore the possibility of owning a company, and I had been there 23 years at Binkley and Hearst, and in 2006, we finally finalized that purchase. And one of the things that I was very, very committed to was that we would use that business as a platform from which to honor and glorify Christ. And it was an incredible journey along the way. And again, many, many, many stories of God's faithfulness. But when I got to a point, I went to one of my coaches, and I said, so where is somebody who is faithful and wants to see God put himself on display through the, the work platforms. Um, so they gave me a couple of names, and I said, great. We contacted them, and we began to get together um, in a restaurant once a month, 
and just celebrate what God is doing. Hey, it was really cool we saw God do this. Hey, it was really neat we saw God do that. And then more people came and more people came. So finally we said, we got to give this thing an identifier. We, we got to, what do you call it? It's, well, it's just a men's gathering. Well, there's lots of men's gatherings. So to shorten that a whole lot, we selected BCN. We intentionally kept the Christian part out of it because that's a word I really very rarely use because of how that word has been prostituted and how really confusing it is anymore to some people. And so we call it BCN Business Community Network. And if you're interested in checking it out, I'll hang around up here for a little while. Um, BCN, I have some cards, and you can just go online and check, but it would be bcnlife.org. And it's been amazing to me what God has done through that, bcnlife.org. So what is it? It is a gathering of people um, who meet typically over food, um, either 6.30 to 8 o'clock a.m. or uh, 11.30 to 1. There's one over at Oregon Dairy on Tuesdays. Uh, but they're consistently every month, like tomorrow morning, there'll be one down below the buck that opens at, I mean, that starts at 6 o'clock. We'll go from 6 to 7.30 and then go from there. So they're popping up all around. Uh, there's a group up by Mount Joy that wants us to help them to start one. And we had somebody come from um, New York, and he said, what is this BCN thing? Tell me about that. And so I started telling him, and he said, well, is it a 501c3? Is it a, an LLC, an LP? What is it? And I said, no, 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 it's none of them. He said, what is it? And I said, I don't know. We've been accused of being a movement. And again, it doesn't matter where you sit on Sunday mornings. We have people that attend these gatherings and participate and grow there and don't darken the door of a church. And we've prayed with people to receive Christ who don't darken the door of a church. We try to get them plugged in afterward. But the BCN is something that is just, a, it's a movement, I would say. And it's, um, there's, there's freedom to come there and just talk. There's freedom to celebrate what God is doing. There's freedom to ask for prayer. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, Sam A., what, what would you say is the primary uh, bl benefit to you to participate in a BCN as you have for several years? So yeah, Jeff is uh, part of the one there at Lidditz, and they're all around. So again, not to take any more time, but I will be available up here. I just have some business cards that you could come and check um, if you wanted to get the connection information. All Sounds good. great. Thank you, Don. One final comment very quickly. I think what I told you last month is that I see value in bringing speakers in that expand our thinking and broaden our perspective on the world around us. And if that didn't do it tonight, I don't know what will. With that, we're going to close. One more huge hand for Judge Jeff.